Um, so, uh, I haven't gotten back. I, I, I like to usually get back the assignments uh, before our first class, but I haven't, I'm only about, I'm not even halfway through them yet, so I'm still looking at the assignment threes. Uh, my plan is right now is I will finish this up, finish those up before the next class. Um, so I'll probably go over the assignment three, talk about it um, on Thursday then. So, but, but yeah, you, um, I haven't returned back those to anybody yet. Uh, it looks like most everybody, uh, everybody had submitted something, and most everybody looked like we're doing pretty well, at least in terms of the um, uh, the the, uh, the running the tests and stuff. So, um, but but yeah, I've gotten behind on those. So, uh, looking forward. So I know some people have already been asking about tests. Um, the, we we're basically going to go through logistic regression this week. Uh, in fact, I don't know. I might cover most everything in the logistic regression uh, notebook today. So. Um, and I am planning on having our a midterm test next week. Um, yeah, I don't have too many people here yet, but um, so I will continue discussing that. Uh, we'll, we'll probably do some review next week. Uh, the, the the test format, and I, I never since I'm, since mostly we do stuff as uh, assignments in Jupyter notebooks and things like that. Usually the tests end up being pretty similar to the assignments. Uh, I just give a kind of a timed portion, so I think I'm still planning on doing that. Um, um, I will probably post a notebook with some questions, uh, and you have to fill it out, but you will have. Uh, like a time limit, so you'll have to start uh, like a quiz like you would normally do in D2L uh, in order to get access to the, the, the questions and then, but then you would do some questions, do, do, do your work inside of a, like a Jupyter Notebook uh, in order to answer the questions and then submit that through D2L uh, most likely, so. Um, yeah. Anyway, that, that, that's what I've done in the past. I don't really like the format that much, but um, but I, I don't usually do this class as kind of type of things where multiple choice, true, false questions, or like, I don't know, mathematical proofs or things are, are really all that uh, uh, interesting. So I'll probably stick with that format. So. Um, and I, I also, I've already gotten behind, only about, only about halfway through the semester here, but um, I will, probably be posting uh, I'm going to ask you guys to do a little bit of a um, of a, more like a project uh, I've mentioned this before so we'll have six assignments and then I'll have something that's a little bit more open-ended more like a uh, an additional assignment but where you have to pick a data set um, and try and apply some of the things that we've been discussing in this class. So do some data cleaning and some exploration and then try and uh, train a model uh, to um, uh, some sort of prediction model on the data set that you do, so. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the the test yes. yeah the the test will probably be through D2L yeah I, I won't do it face to face yeah so um, um, it'll be uh, through D2, a D2L quiz yeah. So. Uh, yeah probably I mean I don't know um, I'll ask if people uh, want some additional I'll probably open it up like on Thursday and Friday uh, like like maybe Thursday after class I'll give like maybe a final uh, chance if anybody wants to ask any questions review stuff. Uh, but have it open um, sometimes Thursday, so you can take it Thursday, Friday. I, I could probably extend that a little bit if people want. Uh, okay, right. So, so, but that's what I usually do um, for the test in terms of the, the time and stuff. So. Um, yeah, um, it'll probably be about two hours. It'll be kind of similar, I think, questions. So, like the actually the first. Uh, assignment that we have. So it'll probably be some things like writing some functions and stuff, although um, it'll be more uh, some functions uh, in order to do a logistic regression or uh, linear regression or something like that. Um, okay, and um, I will post something about this final project, but just as a head up for you guys, um, um, 
probably uh, I'm going to give one or two places. Uh, if you want to start looking at this, the um, uh, UCI. Uh, I usually point people at this one as kind of just a good. Yes, I said the 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 good thing, and I'm, I'm going to try and also I'm going to get this posted because I'm going to ask people maybe to uh, give me an email by the end of next week as well of of the of of a data set you've selected, so at least make a decision about something uh, to work on for that. Uh, that extended kind of project that uh, I mean it to be kind of more of similar in terms of work to the assignments that we do in this class but you will have to drive it so you'll have to pick a data set uh, do some analysis of it um, and try and build a model a classification or a regression model um, on the data set so um, but um, but yeah a good source of those is, is the, the, the UC Irvine uh, repository um, I'll try and find maybe one or two others uh, suggestions. Of, although also, I mean, I do sometimes have people in classes like these, uh, you're, you're working on your own research or something, so if you already have like a data set or something and want to kind of double dip, uh, want to maybe do some analysis uh, with that, that, that also works well uh, for this class, uh, for this kind of a, a project. So just, just let me know what the data set is and the source is. Uh, but yeah, you guys can begin thinking about that. Uh, I'll probably try and set a deadline to at least give me uh, um, uh, an, an email about uh, what you're thinking of, because I'll probably try and force people to at least not be doing using the same data set. So, so yeah, if you come in early, kind of a first come first serve. Uh, if, if, if some people look through this and end up wanting to pick the same one, I'm probably only allow one person per uh, uh, data set on that. Um, okay, well, um, yeah, besides that, uh, like I said, uh, I'll just go through the logistic regression uh, today. Um, and I'll, like I was saying, I, I think I might end up kind of finishing that up. So that, that will only leave maybe reviewing the assignment and talking about other stuff then on Thursday. Uh, and then after that, next week, uh, I'll try and do some activities where we just do, do an overview of the stuff we've done so far. Uh, Talk about things for the for the the first test and also for this uh, assignment in a little bit more detail the um, the, the the kind of final uh, project assignment thing. So. All right, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and then. Uh, make certain this runs here cleanly. This. Uh, final notebook on logistic regression shouldn't have any cells that take very long yeah, it should run pretty quickly for most people um, okay so for the past two weeks we've really been uh, concentrating on linear regression um, so, so doing regression problems um, and your assignment that you just completed um, uh, was a regression problem so um, we can use mostly all the same concepts that we talked about in terms of fitting a model uh, using the, um, uh, the, the um, mean squared error fitness function and using some sort of an optimization method like gradient descent. We can apply those uh, in order to fit a model to a classification problem. Uh, but we need to make some changes, okay? So logistic regression uh, that we're going to, if you haven't looked at this notebook yet, uh, we have to modify some things a little bit in order to make it work. If, if we want to build a model to make classification predictions instead of regression predictions, all right? So the most obvious is that, uh, so, so we're going to just start with a binary classification. So as usual, we can generalize this pretty easily to multi-class. Um, classification, uh, but but uh, you can get all the basic ideas you need if you just think about binary classification. So uh, just think about you know we want to predict either zero or one um, uh, to start with here. So the first most obvious is we need some way to take the output 
Uh, so if we have some set of theta, right? So, so I'll just start here. Um, if we have, like we've been doing for our regression, um, um, uh, if you remember, um, somehow we're going to have a cost function or a fitness function that we can use to optimize to find a set of theta that will give us the best line, the best linear regression model, right? Um, and in terms of creating a prediction, um, the, the reason why we use this format, a little bit of a review here, is you know, we can use a simple uh, linear algebra um, notation here, right? So this is really doing the, the, the dot product. So this is like a vector vector multiplication or, or a matrix vector multiplication. But by doing the dot product of this, it's really multiplying each of the theta times each of the feature uh, and summing those up. So it's really like a weighted, weighted sum here. And if, this is, and if x instead of just one sample is a, uh, a matrix, so we have multiple rows, uh, we, we end up with a matrix uh, vector multiplication, but we end up with just one prediction, one regression output for each of the samples that we're trying to create a prediction for, right? So hopefully that, uh, you're following what I'm saying there, right? So, so um, um, the, the stuff that we did in the last two weeks um, uh, uh, was based on that idea. And this is really just very shorthand notation for we've got a set of our, uh, our theta, our parameter values that we've learned somehow or that we fit somehow using a cost function. Uh, and once you have those, we can make predictions, okay? So uh, back to... Uh, classification here, um, the, the most obvious problem is I, I really need to end up with an answer that's either 0 or 1 if I want to do binary classification, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, this is what we normally do. And th this always confused me. This always confused people. Um, mathematicians uh, like to mix. So we've used sigma for different things, even in this class. Here we're using sigma to mean a function here. It's really the name of our sigmoid function, okay? So the, the, there's other kinds of functions you can use to do classification, but the one that's most typically used is, is the sigmoid here, right? And this is the equation for it, but um, if, if you look at the, the shape, so if you plot the sigmoid, this should make sense because what it does is no matter what the value is that you input to your sigmoid, it could be like really big negative or really big positive value, but notice it squashes the result to some value between 0 and 1, okay? Um, so it's not a discrete result, so you can get values in between. So in fact, um, if, if you're... Uh, result of doing the weighted sum ends up being zero, you get a value of 0.5 here, right? So, so, if, if, um, so if I can step back here, um, we're going to use the sigmoid function. Um, um, so whatever the result of doing the weighted sum of multiplying our, um, our inputs times the, the theta is, and so multiplying those and summing those up, uh, we're going to pass that through our sigmoid function. The result will be some value between 0 and 1, right? Uh, but it is, it, it can be any value in between there. If, it's, if, if that weighted sum was a really big negative number, we'll get some result close to 0. And if it's a really big positive number, we'll get some result close to 1. If it's somewhere around 0, though, we'll get some value in between, right? Something exactly 0, you get, we'll get a 0 point. And, and, um, um, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but uh, we typically use zero as our threshold. So we've run across this before as well when we talked about classification the first time. So uh, when we make our final answer, our final prediction, we have to predict either zero or one. We can't say 0.4 or something like that, so some real value number, right? So. Um, um, the, the, the default threshold that we'll use with the sigmoid function is, is zero. Uh, or, so anything that's less than 0.5, we'll predict zero for it. Um, and anything that's greater than 0.5, uh, we'll predict one for it. And if you look on this, that means that anything where this weighted sum ends up being less than zero, we're going to predict the, the negative case, the, the no or the zero or the false case. And any, anything where the weighted sum ends up being bigger than zero, we're going to uh, make a final prediction of one, or the true case here, the positive case. All right? 
So that's one difference. Um, so we're just using that. So, so where before we called this like y hat, uh, now we're calling this p hat, right? So, so for our logistic, uh, we'll take the same thing we did before, but we'll run it through the sigmoid function uh, to get our predictions, right? Um, Um, oh, and, and um, uh, then to have the final y hat like we had before, um, I was already discussing this, but we'll use some sort of a simple threshold, right? And like we talked about before, we, we can change that threshold. So if we, if we want to play around with the bias uh, um, variance trade-off or the, um, 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 like, like we talked about um, um, uh, bef before, when, when we talked about classification, uh, if we want to plot the um, um, yeah. <laughs> drawing a blank here, let me bring this up real quickly. Uh, so when we talked about classification before here, uh, uh, in the, the binary classification, we, we, we had uh, a little bit about um, the, the, our trade-off of the, the precision and recall. That's what I was trying to remember, right? So, so really, when we were talking about trading off precision and recall before, it was really modifying that same uh, threshold parameter, okay? So, so back to here, when we're talking about like logistic regression, we are doing classification now. The default is to use uh, zero, which gives a threshold of 0.5, but we could change that again like we did before to get um, um, different uh, trade-offs on precision and recall for classification. Okay. Um, and one final thing here before I move on. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I always mention this. I can't help um, uh, bringing this up. Um, so, you know, the, when I first started learning about this stuff, logistic regression always confused me because it's got regression in the name. But it is best to think of logistic regression as classification. It is a classification method, even though it's got regression in the names. Historically, um, it, it, it had that in the name. But, but, but you should think of regression as distinctly different from classification. Um, they, they are uh, um, um, two different kinds of things, two different categories of things that we do uh, in machine learning here for supervised learning. So anyway, um, so that brings us up to we've we've modified um, our function slightly uh, to make it a little bit easier for doing binary classification. So we added in the sigmoid. So now we're going to get a result be between zero and one that we can easily threshold to be at either zero or one as our final prediction that we want to make. So our final uh, y hat here using some threshold. Um, so uh, modifying that function, uh, we need to come up with a cost function like we did before so I can fit a model. So I can find the best set of theta that give me uh, the, the, the most, you know, the, the, the best predictions possible, right, to, that minimize some cost. Yeah. Um, so here we have to come up with a different cost function than, than we did before because um, our, we're talking about binary classification here. So um, the, the true value that we want to predict is going to be either 0 or 1 for binary classification. All right. Uh, so we want. Uh, so that's another reason why we want to squash this because you know we, we don't want some value that can be really big, much bigger, really bigger than zero, right? So for regression, uh, the result of doing this weighted sum could be some value, really big value, like a million, or some really big negative value, like negative a million, right? So by squashing this into uh, the range zero to one, um, I can come up with a, this new cost function here, uh, rel relatively easily. Right. So this is the one that we typically use. We just use the log of our uh, the p hat here. So the p hat is some real value number between zero and one after going through the sigmoid. Right. Um, 
Um, so since p hat is 0, 1, uh, if, if you know the way the log works is uh, um, uh, the log of 1 uh, ends up being uh, uh, really close to 0. And, and, and you can't actually take the log of 0. Uh, that's, that's infinity. But the closer you get to 0, uh, the bigger the log is. Uh, the, the negative of the log, I should say. Um, right. um, you can try it out yourself, um, uh, or you have to go back and remember how logs work. Um, so if we just concentrate on when, we're, when the true answer is a 1 for binary classification, uh, we just want to use the negative log as the cost function. This works as a cost function, okay? So, um, and I encourage you, you know, to understand why, uh, it, you know, if, 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 uh, you know, follow along here what I'm saying. So, a, a cost function needs to work in this way that it should be zero when we're making good predictions or as close to zero as possible, right? So that's, the, so again, we're only looking at the case when the true label for our binary classification is one here. So whenever it's one, and if I'm predicting one, if the result of going through my um, weighted sum and then going through the sigmoid is one or close to one uh, here for doing that, um, I get a cost of zero, which is what I want. Cost goes zero. But if, if my true answer is one and I'm getting, after going through my sigmoid, taking the weighted sum through my sigmoid, if I get something close to zero, I'm going to end up with a high cost. Right, and, and you know this is uh, logarithmic or exponential. So the closer it is to zero, uh, the, the the cost starts exploding. Right. So, but once I'm I'm below 0.5 or 0.4 or 0.2, I start getting costs two, three higher. Right. Does that kind of make sense. Uh, but we have to treat this to to do binary classification here. Uh, we have to treat this as a piecewise function. I need to do the opposite. Uh, when, when I'm trying to make predictions where the true thing should be a negative or where y should be zero, right? So in that case, we just take one minus p hat, uh, one minus the output from um, um, going through the sigmoid function here, right? So the result is the second one here. So any time where, the, where y is zero, where the label is zero, I want to use the other version of the function. So in that case, again, uh, whenever I'm predicting zero, I should have a cost really close to zero. But whenever the further I, further I, away I get from zero, goes from to one, my cost should be getting bigger and bigger. Right? I should be pe penalizing whatever my thetas are if they're making bad predictions. You know, if I should be predicting zero, but I'm predicting one or close to one. So that's the essence. Uh, and there's reasons why we use these. Um, I'll touch on some of these uh, a little bit here. Um, but, um, but yeah, we, uh, we can combine these. So we can use a little bit of a mathematical trick to have a cost function uh, uh, like we talked about before for regression, right? So using that concept we just talked about, uh, uh, we just multiply. So, so we've got M samples here. Um, and I've got some theta, so we're hiding our theta here in the p hat. So p hat uh, is the result of taking the theta times the, the, the sample input uh, and putting that through the uh, sigmoid function. Right? So that gives me a p hat for the ith uh, input, for the ith sample here. Right? Um, but if my, if my label is a 1, then I'm just going to be multiplying one times times the, the log of p, and, and actually there's a negative. We factored out the negative here, so it's one times the negative log of p, uh, like like we did up above here um, for the figure. Right? But if y is zero, then this will zero out, and one minus that will be one, right? So so we uh, it's, it's kind of a trick, but we take the piecewise function and and change it into uh, just a, a regular function of one uh, of one term here by using y and one minus y. Right? Um, hopefully that that makes sense. But but this will give me basically 
the, a similar idea of a cost function, right? So uh, what you expect if you follow the argument, the logic here is because of the way the log works for the cost function, uh, every one of these samples that makes a bad prediction ends up getting a high cost that we sum up. Uh, and, and every one of these that makes a good prediction, you know, so when y is 1, the, the, the log of the p hat is going to be close to 0, so it doesn't add very much to the cost. When y is 1 and we're predicting 0 instead, um, um, we're going to get a high log of that. And that, that ends up adding a lot to our, the cost here. All right. So anyway, um, if you do that, this, this ends up being a valid cost function, and we do a similar thing like we did before. We sum up all of the uh, um, costs that we had for some theta. And again, we're kind of hiding the theta in this first version of the cost here in, in this p hat. Uh, we sum those up and we take the average of those. Um, so this is really the, the average of the of this log logistic cost function for some theta that we have here. Right. Um, so if um, if you follow that, and if you kind of compare this back to uh, when we did gradient descent, uh, so we've now got a perfectly valid cost function, um, and um, there's the one problem with this is um, um, uh, there's no uh, easy way to solve this analytically. So there's no equivalent to the, um, the, the normal equation like we had for linear regression. So we can't come up with a simple uh, solution that we can just solve. But uh, one reason why the log is used is it is defined, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but the derivatives of this expression um, is uh, definable, is, is easy to find, right? Uh, and this is what the derivative is right here. So this is the the, uh, the, the partial derivative with respect to each one of the, uh, the features, j, like we did before for gradient descent. All right? So it has this form. Um, and, and, you know, you know again, we, had, we were using PS. I, I was taking this from our textbook or from Dr. Ng's. Uh, treatment of the logistic regression here. So it's, it's not easy to, to see how the, the, the derivative gets derived from the, the cost function that we have here. Right? But again, you should remember that this p hat, if you expand that out, that's really the sigmoid times the, 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 the theta t times the x's here. Right? If I was to expand out what, how, how the p hat comes. Uh, but in taking the derivatives of the logs, they kind of cancel out. Uh, but if I can go back, like, if you go back and look at the, um, I think it was in the, the 5.2 where we talked about the cost gradient. If I open that one back up again. Uh, oh, not that one. Um, I guess it was the, the gradient descent one. where we were talking a little bit about the um, uh, cost function. I get, uh, no. Sorry, uh, I guess it was in the first one here. Um, anyway, yeah, so, so it was in the, the first one, uh, so we talked about probably two weeks ago, right? So just to remind you, so. Uh, we, we derive the cost function using the mean squared error, and it looked something like this, right? So it was really just the, the, taking the difference of the predictions versus the true label, squaring that, summing that up, and taking the average of that divided by n. That's, that's the mean squared error. Um, and we didn't really show, but um, Uh, when we talked about gradient descent, uh, we showed the derivative of that um, mean squared error function. 
There it is at the bottom here uh, when, we, when we got talking about uh, the details of how gradient descent works. Uh, we didn't really uh, uh, derive that, but this was the form that we claimed uh, the partial derivative with respect to each of the features looked like. Uh, it was pretty similar to the mean square error. So this is really the, the same thing that we did before. It's the difference, but instead of squaring it, we multiply that times the, the input, the xj, and that gives us the derivative or the gradient with respect to each one of the features j, all right? Um, so, you know, you don't have to understand how you derive the, the partial derivative, but um, um, just kind of, you know, this comes from that cost function, taking the derivative of it with respect to each j, and you have this form, right? But, so what I wanted to do is kind of compare this to um, uh, the derivative that we're looking at for a logistic function, right? It's really the same thing, right? So look at this one. Um, and then we'll go back and look at here, right? So uh, it, it's, it's uh, if you look carefully, it, it's all the same. Uh, so we're taking the sum over all the samples of our um, prediction. So this is really p hat, the prediction in our sigmoid minus the true value. Um, you know, but again, the true value is 0, 1. So, so by putting through the sigmoid, we get a value between 0 and 1 here, and then multiplying that times the jth feature to get our um, um, gradient. Right? The only difference between this one and um, our gradient before is we have to take the sigmoid of our prediction there before we subtract. All right. So um, uh, the the reason why that's kind of neat is that that's another reason why the uh, logistic, why this function, the cost function, is defined like it is, right? So by defining the cost function using the log, um, so we get this form, the derivative comes out to something that's pretty much the same as when we're doing regression. So we can use the same technique for gradient descent. The only difference being um, for uh, classification that we just take the sigmoid of this inside of here to calculate our gradients. So that means that you know if you followed, uh, we, we had an example implementation of gradient descent uh, two weeks ago. Um, so you can pretty much use exactly the same code with just a minor modification that you have to take the predictions through the sigmoid to get your gradients. Okay, so um, so anyway, however you think about that, you know, from our cost function, you know, we, we, we don't really have a closed form solution, but it's easy to apply this since, since the, the, the gradient or the partial derivative uh, works out relatively easily uh, using this cost function. We can um, use optimization methods like gradient descent or, you know, better ones. Uh, at some point in this class, we, I should talk about uh, some of the, the things that the real methods that are used, um, like atom solvers and other stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit at some point. Uh, but we can use basic gradient descent to uh, uh, find a, the, the, in some sense, the best sense set of parameters that minimize the cost for our classification here, okay? Um, and one, one final thing before I move on to this, it's, it's not the, you know, so, so if you understand the way the cost function works here, it's not best in terms of, for example, accuracy, right? So we're not saying that we minimize to get the, the, the highest percentage, uh, ac ac accuracy percentage here. We're, we're minimizing this cost function, okay? So it, it, it's going to be the set of theta that ends up having the, the, the smallest cost for this defined cost function here um, that we will end up getting um, as a result of maximizing this. Okay, so let's, let's move on to some stuff that's more concrete then. So uh, from that cost function, I mean, that's really what uh, the basic logistic regression from scikit-learn is using, right? So if you don't specify anything else, it will use um, this cost function um, that we just showed here uh, if you want to do uh, a binary classification 
um, using the logistic regression method. So, um, as an aside, then um, I don't, don't remember in this class if we've looked at the Irish data set before. This is another common data set like the MNIST that we've used. So, if we haven't uh, used it before, um, the uh, Iris data set, it's, it's relatively small. There's only a couple of hundred uh, actual samples in it, and it's only got four features. Uh, but it's an example of a multi-class classification problem. So there's, there's actually three classes in the Iris data set, um, um, Virginica, Setosa. So these are like flowers, uh, or uh, what is it? Um, um, they're they're um, a particular type of flower, um, and the the four the four features that we have are measuring like the petal length and width and the the, the length of the stem, and the width of the stem I guess or something like that, um, in this data set here. So, um, but but yeah, we can use this data set. So in the first example here, we we just we, we want to turn it into a binary classification. Um, and we want to be able to visualize the decision boundary real easily, so we'll just use one feature. Uh, so what we use, what, the pedal width, so feature number three in this data set um, is just the pedal width. Um, and if you look at the actual labels, they're labeled zero, one, and two. So it is a multi-class classification, so two is Virginica, and zero and one are not Virginica. So we'll, we'll turn it into a binary classification by um, just uh, uh, saying all the twos are um, the, the positive class, uh, and the not twos will be the negative class here. All right. um, so let me look at this. Um, this first fit here, we don't specify any. We don't specify any um, uh, um, parameters for the model here, right? So, we, so we just fit the x and the y. So it, it does the default. But since we're passing in uh, basically a binary class, it should fit a binary classification here using the cost function that we were talking about. So, um, so let's just jump right to it, right? So we're only using one feature. So, so x just has the pedal width. Um, so we can see some, some, some of the things that result from this. Um, so, um, and um, you'll have to use some of these things. And the next assignment after our test next week, uh, we'll be doing some things with support vector machines, uh, but you have to do some similar stuff to what we show uh, starting here in, in this textbook. So we want to try and visualize the boundary, uh, and this code comes directly from the textbook from the, the chapter uh, four, talking about logistic regression here. So uh, you can ask, once you fit a, um, a logistic regression, you can just ask it to give you a final prediction, zero, one, but you can also ask it to predict the probability, right? So this will be the result that comes out uh, from applying the sigmoid function. All right. So in this case, we use that. So not all methods in scikit-learn can give you uh, the, the the probability um, um, uh, like this, right? But some of them can. Um, so Uh, the, the, the first line here, the green one, is coming from this first plot here. So we're, we're pulling out the, the probability. Uh, so really, this is applying, you know, for the pedal width feature, um, uh, you're seeing what the result of the theta parameter. So remember, since we've only got one feature, we're going to end up with only a, a, a bias term, so, so two theta parameters as a result here, right? Some bias term. Um, and then uh, the, the theta one that we're multiplying times the, the, the pedal width that we get here. Right? Uh, but, uh, you know, but just at the end here, we can see that we end up, the decision boundary ends up where, where uh, we end up with a 0.5 uh, from the output from the probability ends up right here, right? Um, 
and the other stuff again we're, we're recreating this plot from the textbook right so so for example we show um, uh, in our data set we just show what the um, um, here is where we're actually plotting the green triangles and the, the blue squares um, So uh, I was trying. I was trying to remember. I think there's more samples than this, but um, um, so you can see the decision boundary. Um, so these were the things that were actually Virginica samples. So you know it's not going to be perfect. We've only got one feature that we can fit a model to, and the the cost function that I showed you uh, is a linear. It's going to create a linear decision boundary. Okay, so um, we'll talk more about that. But but our, the last assignment, uh, we by fitting a polynomial, we actually got a nonlinear uh, regression. You can also fit a, a non get a nonlinear decision boundary for a cost function. So we'll see some examples of that starting um, after uh, after we take our midterm test here. But for now, we're going to end up with just a simple line, right? And since we've only got one feature, that line is going to uh, uh, divide. Um, so, um, so since everything that's below, the, the, the boundary ended up being at 1.66 um, in this case. So everything with a pedal width below that is going to end up having to predict that those are not Virginica. And everything above that, um, uh, uh, we'll have to make a prediction that it is Virginica. Okay. So, you know, it won't be able to divide this perfectly. We would need more features than that in order to get um, a better decision boundary. Um, so, so some of these will, will get wrong. Um, so what else was in this figure here? Um, so, and, and then Right, so, so the two main methods, so whenever you're doing a classification, sometimes you'll be able to, to get out the probabilities. Uh, you, so you can usually think of that as how certain it is that it thinks it's the particular class or not. So for a binary classification, you only have one probability. Uh, but as we'll see here, skipping ahead, uh, if you want to do a multi-class classification, uh, um, some of these classifiers will give you a probability for each of the classes. Right. So, but in this case, um, it's, it's the probability that it's the uh, the positive class. Um, so, but if, if you want a final, so all of the classifiers will support a predict method, which will give you a final answer, a final prediction. So, for binary classification, um, you know, as we can see from this this figure, since this is our decision boundary that we come up with, um, uh, anything above that should end up with a prediction of one uh, if we give it new stuff to predict. Anything below that would just come out as predicted as zero, as not Virginica. Okay. Um, Okay. Yeah. So I think that's that's everything on this figure. So ah. Okay. Um, so just being uh, getting getting a little bit more complex. Um, uh, so sticking still with binary classification, but uh, let, let's see what happens if we use two features, right? So, so all we're doing here is instead of using one feature, um, we use both the pedal width uh, and the pedal length now. Right? So we were just using the, the feature number three, which is the pedal width. So we'll use two and three, the, the last two, uh, give the length and the width of the pedals for these flowers in this database, right? Um, So yeah, I did want to discuss this because we will be needing to do this. So if you want to visualize the decision boundary, of course, if you have more than two features, you can't really visualize it. But but as long as you keep it down to two features, 
you can see, uh, use different techniques. Um, so the easiest is to use a contour plot uh, in order to visualize the, the, the probabilities uh, that end up being calculated for each of the, the, the points on your space, all right? So if that doesn't make sense, um, uh, let's look at the final um, uh, result here. So um, the, the petal, so we can see uh, more of the samples here. So we're using just two features now, the petal length and the petal width. Um, so for the, the flowers in this database, the, the petal length um, varied from something around, around three centimeters up to um, close to seven centimeters. Right up here, so so all these these points uh, are varying on the, on the petal length over this range. Likewise for the petal width, so they they, they range from around one centimeter to uh, maximum up here around two and a half. Okay. Um, so once we've we, once we've fit the best model using the cost function for you know the two features here doing our binary classification, we can visualize the resulting decision boundary uh, doing this, right? So it's a little bit of a trick. Um, 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 we, we actually also show, uh, remember for the assignment before the most recent one, you had to uh, plot the decision boundary for the classifier, right? I, but I kind of gave it to you how to do it. We're doing the same thing here, right? So again, since we have two features, we can pull out the coefficient um, and use the, the equation of the line uh, to figure out where that actual decision boundary is. So that's where the, the dashed black line is. Um, so we pull out the, the zeroth coefficient uh, and the intercept and the first coefficient um, to find the equation of that line that results. Right? So that line should exactly fit on the, the place where the sigmoid gives a result of 0 0.5. Everything to the left and lower of that line uh, is going to give a probability after doing the weight and sum and going through the sigmoid of less than 0 0.5. And everything to the right or above kind of that line uh, ends up with a probability uh, bigger than 0 0.5 after going through the sigmoid. Right? So if we use that as our threshold, um, you can see again; it's not perfect. Uh, so, some any, anything above that is going to be uh, classified as Virginica. So, all these are correct, but some of these blue um, squares um, are going to get uh, classified incorrectly using the two features still. Right, and and again for these two features, there's no perfect uh, linear boundary. So, uh, I don't think there's, there's no way we can cleanly separate these. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm discussing things again a little bit ahead of some of the stuff that we'll talk about in more detail in this class. But but um, for a linear uh, boundary, uh, there, there's no th these two classes aren't linearly separable. So we have to have something a more complex decision function in order to get perfect uh, 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 perfect classification. Here. Um, but yeah, so we can see a couple of these are going to be misclassified. They're on the wrong side for the Virginica, and a couple of these are misclassified. They're on the wrong side for the not Virginica, for this presumably this best uh, decision boundary that we can make using the cost function as we defined it here. Okay. So, so this is one way that we could visualize the, the decision boundary, but another way is we could use that probability. So if you have a classifier that can estimate the probability, what we're really doing here with this grid and using a contour plot is we, we get all the different common, we get a bunch of different combinations of petal length and petal width. And we ask the, our fitted model to give us the probability of those, and from those we can find out where the contours um, occur occur uh, for the uh, the output from the final sigmoid of our predictions. All right, Does that makes sense. So, all we do here, um, you can probably use most of this as like boiler boilerplate, but we create um, one that ranges from three to seven, two point nine to seven for the the petal length, and one that ranges from uh, 0.8 to two point seven for the petal width. Um, and 
the, uh, the, the mesh grid, then the result of that is going to be a bunch of combinations of all these things. So uh, we really end up in this X new, if you look at it, of, uh, there's actually 10,000 items uh, that each one of them has two values, or, or no, 100,000. Right, and that's because um, uh, we had 500 grid points for the pedal length and 200 for the width. So 200 times 500 gives you the um, 100,000. If I'm doing that right, so that's where that comes in. So, so every every combination of all those. And like if you look, for example, I mean, hopefully this this isn't too mysterious. So if I look at the first five values of this, they're just pairs. So so these are. Um, 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 this should be from like three to whatever, so I must have changed it here below. Let me, let me rerun all this. Um, uh, up to this point here. So, um, so if we look at the actual X new uh, from this plot, the first five of these, um, um, like so, it's basically just doing gridding out this whole uh, thing we want to plot here. So, what would happen is if we ask for the predictions, it, it gives me the predi prediction of the output if the pedal length was 2.9 and the pedal width was 0 0.8, right? Um, and that ends up being like close to zero. Um, because it's, it's it's pretty certain that's not Virginica, and so on. So so we just keep gritting all these out, okay? Uh, up to you know we do all the ones for um, 0 0.8 from 2.9 up to 7, and then we go to like 0 0.9 and so on. But the the grid or the mesh is finer than that. But from that, if you have to do like a contour plot, so uh, 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 um, the result of that the the y probability is just all a bunch of probabilities. So if you contour plot these out, um, um, you can find the, the contour lines, right? So, and, and since the cost function that we're using gives a linear decision boundary, all the contour lines are going to be lines uh, uh, since, since it's a linear decision result here. Um, right. So again, this back to what I was talking about um, You know, if we wanted to change that threshold in order to get a different, uh, um, a different trade-off for like precision and recall for the binary classification class here, uh, uh, we could do that in the same way here. Or if, if we were plotting precision versus recall, it would be like changing this line. So instead of using 0 0.5 for the decision threshold, uh, we could use it down here to 0 0.1. In that case, we would be getting all of the Virginicas correct because everything, but we've been uh, uh, getting a lot of the not Virginicas incorrect. Um, all these things above the, the point one line here. Um, okay, so that. Um, Hopefully that's helpful, but we'll be coming back to that. So this is just a useful general technique. So especially when you have like a nonlinear decision boundary, it's not always possible or, or easy to um, uh, figure out like the, the equation or plot the equation of where the decision boundary is. So in that case, though, you can always usually visualize it by uh, in this method. You know, so you create a grid, um, and if your um, predictor can give you probabilities, you can just find the probabilities over all that grid, and then you can use a contour plot to find um, where your decision boundary uh, is uh, uh, at different levels, um, like you have it here. So, um, so Okay, um, and as a final thing, um, so Everything up to this point in the notebook, we've only been doing binary classification. Okay, so uh, we want to um, extend the idea um, so we can do multi-class. 
Okay, so the Virginica, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Iris data set is really multi class, right? We, we, we changed it into a binary classification task, but there's really, um, um, let me just rerun all the rest of these here. Um, So there's really, uh, what, uh, three classes, Virginica, Versicolor, and Setosa uh, in the iris data set. And these are different kinds of irises. Yeah, so the, the flower type is, is iris um, 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 that we have here. So um, uh, remember, we, we brought this up. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about classification for the first time. So uh, we could just use the cost function that we did, uh, that, that, that we showed before. Um, and uh, so if we needed to build a multi-class classifier, um, we could use the, the one versus many uh, or the one versus one, right? So build multiple binary classifiers and then combine them. Right, so and, and that works. That used to be the default way that logistic regression worked, um, but now the the in, in Scikit-Learn the, the default used to be that it would build uh, multiple binary classifiers and combine them like we talked about. Uh, but now the default this this actually changed in the last year or two. So in fact, the the notebook that you guys might have, I, I just fixed it today. Uh, but you might um, uh, have the old version if you haven't done a poll today. Um, um, the, the, the default, uh, if you want to build a multi-class logistic regression classifier, uh, is to use softmax uh, regression. Um, so this is a variation of the cost function. Um, so it looks like this. I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to go into as much details as we did before. It, it's, we're using the, the same kind of thing. So we start with the, you know, we've got some set of, set of theta parameters, um, but we, we, we do have a different set of theta parameters for each of our classes. Okay, so here uh, in this from the textbook, K is the number of classes. So for our Irish data set, we've got three classes, so K would be three. Here and we're going to have one set of theta parameters for each of the classes that we're trying to train. If we're going to do a softmax regression, all right. So, so we're still doing similar to what I was just talking about. Um, we'll have an individual set of parameters that we fit uh, one for each of our classes. And this is the way you combine them for softmax. Um, so you'll have one output. Uh, uh, for each one of the, the classes, right? So remember, I've got three different sets of theta for my iris data set with three classes here. So that means that, that I would have three uh, S's, as this is called here, one for each of, of my different classes. Um, so then this P hat um, is like we had before, but I, instead of having just one P hat, I have to have one for each one. Right, so before it was the, the estimate of the probability uh, that it was the, the, the positive class, right? So if, I, if my p hat was one, I was really certain that, that the, the label should have been a one. Right? But now when I have multiple classes using the softmax, um, I'm going to have k of these p hats, one for each of the classes, right? And, uh, and, and the way this works, uh, since it normalizes doing this, Again, you can think of this as a probability. So uh, what it'll spit out, if, if we look at here, um, um, I'll just do this as an, uh, to be more concrete here. So think of this, uh, in this example, think of this as each row uh, represents the output um, um, so, so each column is supposed to be for a different class. So, so each row is the output from um, multiplying uh, some set of theta times x, which we don't really, you know, we're not, we don't, we don't have a theta, just some model that we fit, 
at this point here. And we've got three classes, uh, uh, K0, 1, and 2. Right? Um, so the way I think of this, the first one is like the sample. So it, 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 it ends up for the weighted sum that we have a, a negative 2,000 for, for class 0, negative 400,000 or whatever for class 1, um, and, and 5.7 for class 2. Right? And then these are the others for different samples here. Right. So, um, you know, if you go back and look at this, the exponential, you, you can look up the exponential function, but if, if you do the exponentials, uh, this is the raw exponential function of, of, of putting all these through the exp function here. So negative values get squashed down to zero, um, and, and positive values uh, end up getting being very big when you put it through the exponential. So for this first sample, both of these end up being close to zero, and only this one end up having something, right? For this last sample here, all of them are relatively about the same, right? So all these end up being values around uh, 20 to 30 um, uh, for 3.2, and 3.4, right? Um, so the, I don't know, the only kind of tricky part about this, we can, really what the softmax is doing is it's, normalizing uh, the results of this. So it, basically if you sum up each one of these rows and then divide by the sum, you'll get uh, all the values will be normalized to a result between 0 and 1. Uh, and further, the result, it'll be a good probability space. So the sum of all these should sum up to 1 by doing uh, uh, this softmax equation here. All right. So um, again, the looking at I, I think it's best if you just look at this concrete if you don't quite follow the um, uh, the details of what or why we're doing this, right? So, so the result of going through the exponential, and then we sum up the row and, and divide each row by that sum. The result is going to be every value is a is a value between zero and one now, um, and the the sum of all the values for a sample sums up to one, right? So now, like, if we look at the, the second row in my example here, um, where we have these three values, what was the, the raw output from doing the theta times uh, these x values. Um, but we end up with um, a sum of 1. And 90, so this is kind of saying that there's a 96% chance uh, that it was class 0. Um, and you know a three and a half percent chance that it was class one and so on, right? So for this first one, you know it was pretty certain that it was class two. Uh, so it gives a, it gives essentially a zero probability for class zero and one, um, and a, a close to one or a one hundred percent chance it's a class two. Right? And and the the last three were all relatively uh, in, in about the same range, right? So we range from 30, 33 to 40 percent um, once we normalize to the softmax function. Um, so anyway, um, uh, you know, so this is similar to the p hat we had before, but we're going to have one of these for every one of our, our classes. If, if, and, and so if we're doing multi-class classification using softmax, we have to have a way to get a final prediction, a y hat. So again, whichever one of those ended up being the highest one would be what we would predict, right? So like looking at this last one, uh, they're relatively equal, but if we have to make a final prediction, we're going to choose the one that was 40%. It was the highest. So we're going to say we're going to predict class 2 uh, instead of 0 or 1 for this. That's, that's all an argmax does in this notation here. The, the one that had the highest over the k classes. Um, So um, I'll probably just jump over this. Uh, but what it comes down to another thing, the reason why the softmax function works is uh, you can also, you know, it is well defined to figure out the derivatives or the gradients. So you can use softmax 
put it into an optimizer just like we did for our logistic regression fun cost function and the uh, uh, the mean squared error cost function right so, so since we can easily come up with a expression for the gradients we can optimize it uh, for a multi-class uh, classification problem directly um, using the softmax um, so to jump to the conclusion on that, um, the, the main difference, the, the thing I fixed today that you might not have if you didn't do a poll yet, is um, it used to be that you had to specify, um, um, so, so by default it, uh, uh, um, uh, in like a year or two ago, uh, or maybe it's longer than that, but it was using um, uh, like a one versus all uh, if you did a basic logistic regression. And if you wanted to use the softmax, you had to specify the multinomial parameter. Uh, but now by default, it will use multinomial, which means by default now it actually does softmax if you do a logistic regression. So you don't have to specify the multinomial uh, when you create your logistic regression. Also by default, it uses this LBFGS solver. That's, that's really the optimizer that's being used to, to optimize the cost function. But the, the LBFGS um, uh, supports the, the, the softmax. So um, you actually don't have to specify this since that's also the default. Um, so anyway, like, like, so here what we've, what we've done is we fit uh, using all of the features and all of the uh, output classes, right? So we're actually doing a multi-class classification. So, for example, if you ask for the probability, prob A, using that function, you get three probabilities, um, like we showed for the softmax here, right? So for, um, 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 with the, I guess, well, we're, we're still only using two input features, the, the pedal length and the pedal width, like we did before, right? So if we have a pedal length of, Five and a pedal width of two, um, um, it's you know ninety four percent confident that it should be the the third class, the, which which I guess is Virginica here, and maybe it's the second class. Five percent chance is the second class. Right. Um, okay, and then. Right, like to, to end up, so we can do the same trick. It, it's uh, here, uh, though, um, we wouldn't be able to have an equation uh, to find the decision boundary. So, for one, effectively, we've got multiple decision boundaries. Um, so, the result here, though, uh, what? I don't know if I can explain this well, but you, you can see, uh, so by. All we're plotting here is we're using the um, uh, when we do the contour um, so yeah I, I don't know if this is obvious to people I don't know if the textbook explains this well but uh, you know we, we did the same thing we did before but again, we've got three probabilities here. So we just pulled out one of the three probabilities when we did the contour plot. Um, so really, this is the, the, the resulting decision between like class two and the other classes, right? So this is, this is where it ends up being 0.5 between one of them and the other two. Um, but but effectively though you do get kind of a visual a good visualization of the overall decision boundary that results here, um, 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 just because of the way this works. So anywhere that it changes from below 0.5 to above 0.5 is going to uh, uh, be a good uh, location between actually all three of the classes in this case. Um, All right. Yeah. So you know, I, I mean, you know, it's a little bit um, tricky or a little bit subtle what it's doing there. But I, I did kind of want to kind of point that out. But but I guess you know, you should realize that we're really getting back 
probabilities for each one of the three classes. So, but again, to visualize this, we have to only plot one of them at a time. So we're really only plotting the probability of one of those three decision boundaries um, that we had um, in this figure here. Or the, the textbook was only plotting one of the three there, basically. Um, but you probably would just get essentially about the same thing if we used a different one. Uh, yeah, I guess not. So yeah, I mean, this is clearly kind of the difference between uh, this one and these two here. So that was the decision boundary for the iris setosa and the other two mostly. Right. So this, this is the probability that's an iris setosa versus not an iris setosa. By, by pulling out the zeroth one, um, like I just did there. And yeah, and that's the other one. So, yeah. um, all right, yep, so um, that was pretty much the whole thing on the logistic regression. Like I said, um, we got through all that notebook. So uh, I'll stop there for today, uh, unless somebody has some questions. Um, and. So my plan on Thursday is probably we'll, we'll go over the assignments. Um, I'll have a couple of other things, and we'll begin talking about in more detail the, the, the project and the test two as well, or test, test one. So. All right, yep.